Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Phil, for taking us through the case for health, well-being, and productivity in buildings. Um, as Andy said, my name is Duncan Price. I'm Director of Sustainability at Bureau of Hapold here in London. And the focus of my presentation is on how we deliver building performance in practice and overcome this often cited performance gap between design intent and reality. Um, and in particular, I'm going to refer to two projects of ours. The first was a six-month piece of research for UK and Green Building Council um, on delivering building performance. And my colleague Chris van Dronkler at the back of the room was seconded in for six months to, to do this research. Um, Chris is an engineering doctorate student, uh, research engineer, spends half his time with Bureau Hapold, half his time with UCL. Um, and this was looking at the kind of systemic factors at play um, within the, the building development and construction industry. And then I'm also going to refer to this project, which is the David Attenborough building, um, with 1960s brutalist refurbishment. Is that right, Carol? Um, with Nicholas Hare Architects. You can ask Carol Lilliot uh, in the audience all about this over a glass of wine. Um, this is for the University of Cambridge for the Cambridge Conservation Initiative Museum of Zoology and Department of Zoology. Um, and it's a project that's just been handed over and we're starting to monitor. And it's really interesting kind of insights that I thought it's worth sharing with you. Um, but it all starts with people, doesn't it? As Phil said, it's all about people. There's evidence to suggest that as human beings, we spend something like 87% of our time in buildings. 87% of our time in buildings. They, they affect everything we do. Our health, our happiness, our productivity. Um, and, and so it's really, really important. We're increasingly asking an awful lot of buildings, aren't we? They, they've got to be healthy. They've got to be efficient. They've got to be resilient. They've got to be intelligent. And so no mean feat. Um, they're also a strategic value in the fight against climate change. We all know that we've got to rapidly decarbonise the built environment. Buildings account for something like 50% of UK CO2 emissions. And if we're to have any chance of meeting our legal obligations under the fourth and fifth carbon budgets, then we've got to rapidly decarbonise the existing building stock. And uh, as my former colleague Paul Roosevelt at the back of the room will tell us, the, the Cinderella sector is the, the existing building stock. 80, something like 80% of the buildings that will be with us in 2050 are already built, so we've got to tackle the existing building stock as well as push further and harder uh, with the, the new build. And, and yet, we're already experiencing the effects of climate change. We've got year-on-year -year increases in global temperatures. Um, even in the UK, we're now halfway towards our two-degree target set in Paris. And we, if we don't get our skates on, we're definitely going to overshoot the one and a half degree rise in global temperatures. Um, so the buildings that we are designing, completing, refurbishing and handing over right now need to be resilient to this if we're to avoid expending even more energy and, uh, in, in cooling and, and other impacts. And then, of course, we're also expecting buildings to be connected to the Internet of Things and to have intelligent controllers, whether it's voice-activated controllers or connections through a smartphone app. Um, but this creates an awful, an awful lot of opportunity for us to, to really understand what's going on in buildings in a way that was never possible before. Uh, and yet, against this uh, personal experience and the strategic importance, we know that our buildings aren't really delivering what they need to. This graph is from the Innovate UK Building Performance Evaluation Programme, which looked at something like 100 buildings, and it, it shows that there is almost zero correlation between the numbers that we tend to focus on in design, as uh, in, in energy, which is the energy performance certificate, and the display energy certificate, which is a measure of actual metered energy consumption in practice. And that's for very good reasons, but if we're focusing on the, uh, the purple, and what we really need to do is get the white down, then we need to do something different. So, so what's going on? Why, why is this happening? And so the, the, first, uh, the first thing is to understand that we're designing for compliance, not performance, as an industry. I think it's fair to say that um, there is, nobody's taking responsibility for delivering building performance in practice. We tend to focus on the things on the left, which is what we measure in building regulations partel or planning commitments, um, and yet, uh, Actually, it's all the unregulated loads, the detailed patterns of occupancy, all the other barriers that, um, that kind of degrade the way that buildings are used in practice all need to have a plan. They all need to be managed all the way through the process. Otherwise, um, we're not going to get what we want. The UK GBC task group 
found that there's a whole bunch of systemic issues at play here, from a lack of aspiration through to a very fragmented building design and construction industry. And uh, I thought this was quite a revealing graph. This just shows the misaligned incentives up and down the building supply chain. And when we try to find out who it is that's actually focused on energy, even energy performance in practice, we found that there was no single indicator running all the way through that process. Um, and the closest was, uh, was a sort of regulated energy consumption, but even that, as we saw, doesn't really tell us much. So if nobody says, as a project goal, that they want happy people and 100 kilowatt hours per meter square per annum, then we shouldn't be too surprised if that's not what we get. So we, <laughs> we need to focus on setting some really clear, simple performance metrics for building performance in use. And the UK GBC task group suggested that actually should just try and, sometimes less is more, let's just focus on one clear simple metric, kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum, operational energy consumption, and that will act as a proxy for focusing on building performance and use, which will change behaviors across the whole building supply chain. And then through time, we can then build in all the other things as well, but there's a, there's a fog of noise out there, if that's such a thing, um, we need to keep it really simple. Um, but we've got to start by putting people first. So I want to talk through the David Atomer building and some of the insights from that. Um, we, we had an existing building, so we could go and talk to people about what they thought uh, of their existing building, what they liked and what they didn't, and that included, included qualitative evidence. And we found there's actually a lot of things they did like about the building. They liked the location, they quite liked the tall ceilings, they liked some of the views. But the bus survey, which showed quantitative information, showed there's a number of things that actually they weren't terribly happy with including thermal comfort in winter, perceived health, perceived productivity. Um, and so there's plenty to go at um, to, to create a much better place. And so then we arranged a series of workshops with the building users to really understand uh, what worked, what didn't, and try and arrive at consen a consensus of some priorities for the project and plotted those on a, on a graph, an axis of impact versus influence. And the things in the top right included things that mattered as top priorities. That included health and well-being, retaining the existing building, improving the operational energy consumption, uh, and improving collaboration between these disparate research entities and NGOs. Uh, and also biodiversity was, was obviously very important because this is um, the David Attenborough building after all. They got named that later. Uh, so then we set some performance targets and we set a target of at least a 40% reduction in operational carbon. Uh, interestingly, going to look at the existing building loads, a large chunk of it was for servers, but we knew they were going to get relocated anyway, so we, we excluded those from the baseline because we thought that was a bit, a bit too easy. Um, but we thought at least a 40% reduction was quite achievable. And then we did a, a bottom-up analysis using... SIPSI TM54, for those in the know, and we thought we might actually be able to get around 170 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. So somewhere between those two is probably where we're going to end up. Um, and then it's about designing for performance in practice, not just compliance. So, uh, so moving away from the norms of, of design standards, looking at the SIPSI adaptive comfort standard, which is a little bit more forgiving in summer, except in the fact that people are expect, uh, quite happy to have a slightly broader tolerance of summertime temperatures. Also, the University of Cambridge had their own criteria as well, that the internal temperature shouldn't be more than three degrees greater than the external temperature. And then we also looked at future weather years. This is something which is becoming hardwired into planning now in London, which is a, which is a really, really valuable thing. But at the time we're doing this, nobody was doing it. And um, what it shows actually is that you know actually you might get quite a few days right up to you know high 30s and 39 degrees, and there could be sustained periods of a week or two when it's above 30 degrees outside. So we've got to start thinking about different ways of designing buildings to cope with those kind of uh, situations. And uh, and as a result, we we um, we put in phase change material into the roof, the lightweight roof, to provide some additional thermal mass. Other things that went in included internal insulation and double glazing to sort out that winter problem. Uh, it, we punched an, an atrium right into the middle of the building to bring daylight right into the heart of the workspace and then had daylight linking to make best use of the daylight so we could turn off the, the lights when we don't need them. Um, as I say, thermal mass on the top floor through uh, phase change material and then exposed concrete everywhere else 
coupled with nighttime cooling to, to give us the passive environmental control. And, um, and just to flag, one of the things that we're doing in some of the, the buildings now, which we weren't able to do at the time, was to kind of do this parametric analysis to really work out the art of the possible. So, so nowadays, we're, we're taking the things that Phil was talking about, views, biophilia, daylight, fresh air, and being able to run multiple parameters in, in real time. So and if we're doing that again, we'd probably push it further and harder. But it, it's amazing what you can do now with you know, the, the power of digital design. And then it's about control for building performance. So uh, as we know, the energy performance gap is, is about moving away from these regulated loads to the unregulated loads, and then how you control that through construction, commissioning, monitoring, recommissioning, remonitoring, handover, soft landings, all of those good things. You've just got to really, really work at it. Um, so on the David Attenborough building, we set up a sustainability framework with a number of performance targets. They went into the employer's requirements. They were then handed over to the contractor, Kia, who prominently displayed them on the site boards. <laughs> and these are some of the, the metrics from the construction process, working out energy consumption, water usage, and transport emissions as they were building the, uh, doing the refurbishment project. And then we developed a, an interactive, intuitive uh, building user guide, to, which we'll be handing over shortly, um, to really give them a, a sense of actually how to use the building in practice. How do you, because uh, many of you have probably looked at, uh, or maybe have yeah. O&M manuals, they, they, if you can find one, <laughs> exactly, if you can find one, they're probably stuck in a cupboard somewhere and about 10 inches thick. Absolutely of no use to any users of the building. So, created kind of interactive PDFs to think about how you can present that. And then we ran a series of workshops with the sustainability champions in the various organizations. And just like commercial property, there are multiple tenancies within this building. So you've got the Cambridge Conservation Initiative, which itself is a, an agglomeration of something like 40 different NGOs. I think it was yeah. a eight, eight different major national organizations. Eight UN, national, eight, UN, yeah, UN, from all over, all over Europe coming together. So there's a disparate, almost like SMEs, um, and the Museum of Zoology, Department of Zoology. So to, to establish the right governance mechanism so they can work together, because we think of this as a building, but actually as different, different demises. Um, and then of late, spending a lot of time with the contractor and the estates management team at Cambridge to get the meters commissioned, to get the displays, energy displays up and running, not just for the estates team, but also for the building users, so they get that feedback. Um, so we've gone from a, a sort of notional EPC of D up to a B, but the real issue is what's, what's the display energy certificate going to look like? Um, so we're just starting this two-year process of monitoring and evaluation, and um, uh, we're looking forward to seeing what the data tells us. We're on a mission to enter this into the Sibsey Building Performance Awards next year, so um, we have a, a vested interest in gathering as much information as possible. Um, but, but of course, this is really ultimately about great buildings and great experiences, and, and already the anecdotal evidence suggests that the building users really love this building, they really like the daylight, it has totally transformed the way that they operate, uh, the way that they come together around a central atrium and connect and talk to each other. We, we went to the opening, David Attenborough was there, uh, I've got another picture somewhere of him sailing down the green wall in the atrium. Um, and research organisations were coming together in a way that they hadn't before. Um, so I think our hopes are high. Um, in terms of uh, expected outcomes, well, I think the industry consensus is that if we do all these things, then there's great uh, benefits that come from it. And so for the David Attenborough building specifically, something like a 40% reduction in operational carbon, um, at least £200,000 a year reduction in annual energy costs, whilst retaining 82% of the embodied carbon, you know, this is carbon that would have been locked away in a new building probably, um, and just some initial analysis suggests that if you get something like a 10% improvement in productivity, that could be worth about a million pounds per annum. I mean, this, this is really significant. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing what the evidence tells us in practice. So just to kind of draw, draw to a close, I think um, there's some very strong evidence on the business case for green buildings. Uh, many of you may have looked at this publication from World GBC, which is the business case for green buildings. And it... it pulled together the evidence from around the world and demonstrated the, the various interlocking benefits, including health and well-being, uh, asset value, and running costs. And then in 2015, Carbon War Room produced this report, which for the first time looked at how uh, real estate investment trusts perform financially 
versus sustainability, and they found that those with a high sustainability ranking on the, 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 uh, the nationally named Gresb REIT uh, benchmarking survey, those that scored high on sustainability outperformed both in terms of return on equity and return on asset value. Um, so making the, the link for the first time that sustainability really does pay off. So um, I invite you all to focus on building performance. And if we all do that together, then we can change the system and all create winning workplaces. Thank you very much.